So my name is David Nolan. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about closure script and core async. Um, how many people here have ever read about uh, cores communicating sequential processes? Cool. That's good. Has anybody ever programmed, uh, have tried using Golang, Rob Pike's Golang? Only one. OK. Um, has anybody used a language that actually implements CSP? I mean, Go is one. So not that many. So this is something that I think is really, really funny that it's something that nearly everybody has heard of, but nobody's tried. Um, there's been languages in the past. You had um, Occam Pi for the transputer. You had uh, Concurrent ML, which was a variant of standard ML that supported CSP. Um, and Go is actually really making waves, right? People really like it. I don't really like it, but I think the CSP aspect of it is actually pretty cool. The, it, it's very, um, it very much holds uh, very closely to uh, Tony Hoare's ideas. So Rich Hickey decided more or less to just copy like Go's sort of interpretation of Tony Hoare's original ideas. Um, so I'm not going to assume that you know too much about CSP, and so we'll, we'll go slow, but we'll end up going fast later, so it won't be boring if you think you know this stuff. Um, has anybody here tried Core Async? OK, cool, cool, uh, sweet. So that's good. Um, we'll get to, we'll, if you've tried it, then um, you'll see some cool stuff. If I'm moving too fast, just raise your hand and ask a question, because um, I've looked at this stuff so long, I'm probably going to just assume that you can read my mind. Um, and that's probably simply not true. So uh, stop me if something doesn't make sense. So um, I'm not going to talk about core async in the context of closure for the JVM. This is all oriented around closure script. Uh, I do front end development JavaScript at the New York Times. I've been doing JavaScript for eight years now, um, doing user interfaces. I've done user interfaces in Java, Objective-C. Uh, I've written C++, C. I've done them in. Um, God, just about everything, right? And it's all sort of variations on things that I don't particularly like. Uh, so I got kind of excited about uh, CSP because um, I think it's a better fit for the types of things that you end up doing in a sort of user interface. Um, this was actually explored in concurrent ML. There was a thing called Xene. And also Rob Pike had done some pretty cool X Windows stuff um, in the 80s with uh, one of his various CSP-like languages. I mean, Rob Pike has basically been writing the same language for 20 years now, and he finally hit the jackpot with Go. Um, but he was also excited about the possibility of doing UIs uh, with CSP. OK, so here we have a JavaScript file. I'm using line CLJS build, which is a very popular sort of build tool. Um, I'm just going to ha have it on autocompile, so I'm going to just save, like, save my file. It's going to recompile, and we're going to refresh in the browser. So we have a namespace form up here. Um, I've excluded some of these operations that are, are part of the standard library because I want to be able to map, filter, remove, and uh, call distinct as channel operations, not as operations over sequences. Right? So, this, so map, filter, reduce, uh, functional programming. I hope, you know, I'm assuming you guys know about that. So I'm going to import uh, the async stuff. So um, I'll explain this when we get there, but I'm bringing in some interesting stuff. Um, and I need to bring in the macros that allow this sort of magic to happen. So essentially what CoreySync provides, it provides this thing called a Go block. Inside of a Go block, you can actually do what look, appears to be async ops synchronously. So you have the illusion of doing things synchronously. And this eliminates the sort of callback hell. So if you've done anything with evented programming, whether it's Python or JavaScript or Java, uh, you have you know, inner classes. I mean, it just sucks, right? If you've done a lot of that type of thing, it's not fun. Uh, so Go, the, um, this inversion of control problem, inside of a Go block, it, it'll, it gives you the illusion that you can do these things in a synchronous manner so that you don't have to like write your code in continuation passing style manually. So here I have a Go block, and I just want to sort of show the semantics. If you have a Go block, it always returns a channel. So the, so the result of a Go block is always a channel. So if I, uh, I have a demo page here, I'm going to refresh this. And you can see that I console log the result from a Go block, and I get back a channel. So the result of a Go block is always a channel, not 5. right? So it seems a bit strange. I, I returned 5, but actually what's going to happen is that 5 is inside that channel. The channel has that value 
but I haven't read it out. Um, now, I want to be able to read something out of that channel. And so if I'm not familiar with core async, I might think that I can do this. Um, I'm going to console log uh, go5, and it should return 5 in a channel. I'm going to try to read from the channel. The angle bracket bang is like read a value off a channel, if you have a channel. And I'm going to get a nice little error here. It says that you can't do that. You can't do um, a read right outside of go blocks. If you want to have this illusion of, of being able to do things asynchronously without writing callbacks, you have to do all your operations inside the go block. This may sound limiting, but you'll see that you can actually do quite a bit. Uh, enclosure, just to explain enclosure, um, you can do this with the angle bracket double bang. right? So you're allowed to do uh, reads off of channels outside of a go block, but it means that you could potentially tie up a thread. Right? So if you can do angle double bang or um, left what greater than double bang, which is a put. Right? You can read, you can read or t put or take from a channel. Okay. So now that I have, now that I know this, I can be well. That's okay. I'm just going to wrap that expression in another go block, and then I can use. I can do a read off that channel, and then we see console log five, which is what we want, right? So we're allowed to do puts and takes on channels uh, with the put and take operator as long as we're inside of a go block. Okay. So the primitives are really go blocks and channels, and we want we have put and take operations. So here I have a, a I make a channel, and then I have a, a go block, and I say. We got here, I print that, I read off the channel, and then I write this another console log statement. It says, we'll never get here. And this seems a bit strange, and I'll explain. So the semantics of CSP is that writes and reads. When you put and you take, um, there has to be somebody. If I put something, somebody has to take from the other side. Otherwise, inside that go block, it becomes a suspended operation. If I take and there's nothing there on the channel, then again, the operation is going to suspend until somebody puts something. So this is really important, and it's um, very much how Go, uh, Golang works and how the original CSP model was defined. Synchronous operations, right? So in order for this to work, all the magic in Core Async is about uh, sort of in ClojureScript making it appear that we have lightweight threads so, this, that, so that we're not actually going to be eating up threads when we're waiting for something to happen. Is anybody confused about what I just said? Okay. Read that, take a value off the channel. Take a value off the channel. So, so the channel, the channel is it's not a place. It's a conduit, right? I can put stuff onto it, sort of into it, so that people can take things out, or I can take things out, right? right. The the only thing that's important is that if I take try to take something out, and there's nothing there. My my, my I'm going to be suspended until somebody puts something there. You can, oh, OK, good. Good question. You can put anything you want, though I recommend putting immutable values. Okay. And, <laughs> so, uh, and the people know what kind of type. It's di purely dynamic. So it's not like, it's not like in, in Go. So in Go, um, Google's Go, you, ha you, have to, you have to give the channel a type so that these are untyped channels. We can put anything we want, um, though you really should put immutable values so you can avoid the problem you have in Go with race conditions. You can have data races if you put mutable values onto a channel, right? So we don't have that problem. So if I put a sequence of things of different types and then I read them, you, I will get back the sequence of things with types. Anything you put in will come out the other end. So you can put a channel. That's one of the most <laughs> the coolest things you can do. You can put a channel. Channels are first class. So you can put channels onto channels. And there's really cool tricks with, you can do with that. Um, good questions. Keep asking good questions. because like. I know you can't read my mind. <laughs> All right. So this is kind of interesting. I can run, so whenever I have a Go block, remember, it's sort of like, it's sort of like a, even though this is JavaScript, it's as if we had this magical ability to start threads, like right, start these lightweight threads at the same time. So here I've, I, have, I make a channel, and I'm going to write a JavaScript date onto the channel, which is actually not a great idea, because I put a mutable value on the channel. So I didn't do what I said not to do. Um, <laughs> And then uh, in the other Go block, I'm going to read it, right? 
And so this is kind of interesting because what I, what I show here, sorry, I skipped ahead. Let's go up here. OK, so I make a channel. It's gonna, we're going to go there, and we're going to be able to make progress because I have a separate go block that writes something into the channel so that the top guy can proceed. This it sounds pretty crazy, right? It's because these, these, the code is out of order, but we're still going to get progress. Right? So that's kind of interesting. So what this means is that first go block is going to run. It's going to get suspended by the read. The next go block is going to run, allowing the code above to continue. Make sense? Um, and then I, you know, all I've done here is it's the exact same. It's the exact same code. I've just flipped things around. So this is, but this is very interesting. So on the top, on the top one, we're going to write into the channel. Even though I have no expressions later there, it's going to be suspended, right? Because um, until the bottom go block reads, and I can show that you that this is true by going um, before. Right? Because, because nobody read it. But if I do this, boom. Totally works. It's pretty cool. So all right, so this is this is the essence. So you already can see that there's all these amazing games you can play, right? Because you actually have really fine-grained control now over asynchronous operations, which is not normally true when you're doing async stuff. Um, okay. So let's see less trivial stuff, things that are more real world. Um, so here is a, a very simple thing called events. And what it does is it creates, it takes a DOM event and it converts it into a channel um, which will output those events as they happen. So here I can, I can say, you know, this is going to be an HTML element. It's going to be the type of event I want to listen to in the DOM. And what we're going to do is we're going to add a listener on that element uh, of that particular type. And we're going to put each event onto that channel. And you notice events returns a channel. So this is a very common pattern. You construct, you can, you, you construct some source, and you get a channel as a value, so you can listen on it, or you can write to it, or whatever. Does that make sense? So there's a, you're going to see a lot of like constructing channel functions. Um, yes? What's the difference between the uh, greater than and bang? So um, this, this is read. And if it's the other, if the if it's the other direction, it's put. This, sorry, take. I should say I should fix my terminology. This is take. Oh, okay. So why do I have this? So this is this is you can call put and take, which are the uh, um, basically the async versions of these guys. Like this is actually a asynchronous put, so that I don't have to be inside of a go block to put something to my channel, right? I, I told you that these guys can only be used inside of go blocks. But there are places where, like, we're not we're not in the asynchronous world yet. We're not, we're not inside of a, a, a sort of a channel thing yet. So we need some way to get things into the channel outside of the re the rest of the world, right? So put and take are the an are the um, async analogs of these, which have the semantics of being synchronous when you're in a go block. Okay, so. So this is kind of crazy. So this is one of these cool things that, like, if you're into functional programming, you're like, wow, this is pretty nuts. I can hear, this, look, this, this looks like it would not terminate, right? I say go while true, which means this will run forever. Um, and we're gonna, what, the, what it's going to do is what's going to happen, this works because uh, if I don't move the mouse, this go block doesn't do anything. If I move the mouse, it's going to read it, print it, loop around. And then if I stop moving the mouse, it's not going to do anything. So this is like a, this is like a mini event loop. So unlike this, this thing where we normally have like one giant event loop, we can actually make mini event loops with uh, core async. So I'm going to reload this, and we get all our mouse events, right? So, and that, that's pretty nice. We can sort of express through, uh, and you're going to see it, we can actually use this recursion as a pretty cool way to maintain state. Like we can actually hold state in the loop. And that's, if you, if you read up on concurrent ML, you see that they do this trick. This is not a new idea at all. Um, OK. So 
I want to be able to map over channels. I, I'm gonna, I have a channel, and what I want to do is I want to take a channel, and for every event that I get out of that channel, I want to apply some function and write it to another channel. Right? So this is sort of like the first channel transformation that, we've, that, we, that we're going to see. So it takes, it takes some function, which we're going to apply to every value that comes uh, out of in. And what do we do? We make a channel called out. And forever, we're going to read from in, apply f, write it to out. OK, so here's my little function I want to map over every event. I, want to, um, I don't want to deal with this crazy DOM event. I want like a nice little vector that represents the mouse coordinates. So this will take a raw DOM mouse event, and it's going to extract out the page x and page y. I'm going to return a vector. So it look, this looks pretty cool. I can take the mouse move. I can map. Uh, e to V, and that gives me a new channel. And forever, I want to pr uh, read from move, print its value um, out to the JavaScript console. There we go. Cool. That's pretty nice. Um, we can do filter, right? So this, I mean, this is all, this is really just the func this is the channel versions of, of functional operations you guys are probably seen before. Uh, so here we take some predicate function. We take the in channel. And forever, we're going to read from in. If it passes the predicate, we're going to write it to out. So down here, what I do, I'm going to make this ridiculous predicate, which says only if uh, x is divisible by 5 and y is divisible by 10, are we going to do anything. But this is kind of nice. Everything composes. So I have the original source. I convert into a vector of numbers. And then I filter out the ones that, that are where the x component is divisible by 5 and the y component is divisible by 10. Um, and then I, you know, I print uh, out the contents. So you're going to see here that that's the only thing, the only values that appear. right? Uh, well, but it, except, except what you're asking for is impossible, right? I mean, there's no way. There's no way. Like, it's just a different kind of operation. There's no way to unify this the real synchronous world and asynchronous world. They can't be unified. It's not possible. Does that answer your question? I mean, there's no way to do it, <laughs> <laughs> right? Async stuff is async stuff. Um, okay, so this is where it gets really fun. So there's, go ahead. So futures um, are much more monadic, right? So every time you do something to a future, you're going to get a new future. You do. You do. You do need a new channel, but you. But for every event, you don't get. A, you don't have to construct anything new. This is some. This is something that I don't like about promise or future-based models. Is that every step you have to. You, you have to construct something. Whereas I can generate a pipeline, and it's constructed once. So all those mouse events that are flowing through the system, I only constructed. Uh, in this case, uh, three channels. Whereas in a future-based model, every event at every step in the pipeline needs a future. So Elm uses, <laughs> Elm, I don't want to get too far into Elm, but Elm, Elm is very cool. It's an implementation of FRP, and it tries to solve these FRPS problems. I mean, what I'm demonstrating is very FRP-like. FRP does do one thing, which I did not realize that it did. <clears throat> it, 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 it makes a, a very big design trade-off, because it wants you to be able to use signals in a very functional way. But in order to do this, it actually imposes a global ordering on all events. So th there's, a, there's a cost associated with this. And in the CSP model, we say that's really not, we don't want to pay that price. Um, so CSP gives you the primitives to manage synchronization. But it does mean occasionally you have to um, go in there and make sure that things happen in the right order. Whereas Elm tries to do that for you, but at this sort of like global cost 
that every, you know, every part of your program is going to pay for. So, I mean, people way smarter than me know about this. Okay, so if, if uh, reading, so I'm not going to explain this, but Eric Meyer worked for years on this on C sharps async await. We use the exact same compilation strategy as C sharps async await. And async await is basically what theorists say is comonadic. So, core async is also similarly comonadic. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> Well, no, no, as soon as you invoke Eric, as soon as you invoke Eric Meyer, you know, forget it. Yeah. Forget it. Yeah. Um, but I can show you what you can do with it. You okay. must do <laughs> um, so what, this is pretty cool. So, in, so uh, JavaScript is single threaded, but core async actually allows us to do things that I know everybody wants to do. Like there's so many times you're like, I wish I could sleep, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could sleep and not block everything, right? So. Uh, Core Async lets us do this with timeout channels. So timeout channels are a great idea that were copied from Go, the Go language. And basically, it's a channel that will block execution. And after a certain milliseconds, it will, it will, the channel will close, which also allow, allows progress. So here I'm going to write, it as, even though it appears that I've written these statements one after the other, I can sleep for a second um, twice. So let's. So that's, a, that's another good question. So we just use, um, so on the JVM, it's, it's super complicated in that they use um, an executor pool and there's all these locks around channels and all this stuff. In JavaScript, they don't have to do that because JavaScript is single threaded. Um, so what we do for the dispatch mechanism is we pick whatever's fastest. JavaScript actually has a variety of things you can use. The slowest is set timeout. Set timeout has a, um, um, a latency of about five to six milliseconds, which is actually unacceptable for a lot of patterns. So we use that as the worst fallback. Otherwise, we use um, something called message channel. There's a, there's a way to communicate between Windows and browsers now that has, has much lower latency. Um, and we also use set immediate, which is present in Internet Explorer, as well as Node.js. Um, and set immediate is really fast. So you can do, I'm not going to demonstrate it, but there's a really nice um, benchmark in Go where, it's, where you do thread ring, right? You make 1,000 1, channels and you push a value through it on one side and how long does it take you to get out the other side? Go can do this in like 60 to 80 milliseconds. Um, Core Async and Chrome can do it in about 160, which is only twice as slow, which is pretty wild, right? And that's through the dispatch mechanism that we, that we have yeah, just in the browser. So it's pretty good. Um, OK, so that's pretty neat, timeout channels. OK, so, whoops, sorry. So non-deterministic choice. So uh, often when you write a piece of, um, of asynchronous code, you want your little block of code to do something based on whether this happens or that happens. Whether the cha you, li you basically want to listen in on multiple channels. And whoever gives you a value first, you want to sort of conditionally operate on that. Does that sort of make sense? So, so it's a way to like take multiple inputs and process them um, as they arrive, right? So this in Go, this is called select, right? Qu questions about that? So here, I'm going to make a channel. Um, and I'm going to make a timeout channel. And this, primi this uh, primitive operation is called alts. And you give it a vector of channels. So this is a sort of first class operation. You can actually, you can actually grow and shrink that vector. And you can do really cool tricks. Because it, it, this is not, um, in Go, it's static unless you use reflection. Uh, by default, in Clojure, it's dynamic. Uh, so you select dynamically over a vector. Um, so of course, C is never going to provide a value, because we never put anything into it. But the timeout channel will provide a value. And so you saw after a second, you know, the timeout channel closed. Right? But uh, oh, and I should explain this. So what alts returns, alts returns the value that was read off the channel as, as part of a vector, and I'm just structuring it here. So this is the value, and this is the channel that responded, right? That actually responded. Uh, so you can, so you, this way you can do conditional matching. Like, did this channel respond, or did that channel respond? This allows you to do conditional logic. So when a channel closes, uh, nil comes out? When a channel closes, you get nil, yes. And, the, and, you, and that actually, it's important. You can't put nil on a channel. You're not allowed to put nil as a, as a sort of terminal value. 
right? So it, actually, if you try to put nil on a channel, it's going to throw. Um, and if you read a nil off a channel, you know it's closed. OK, so there is alternate syntax, which you can use, which makes um, alt, the alting operation look a little bit more like cond, which is the um, closures version of if else. So here I, it's the same code, but here I can go alt, and I can say you know, either the, the channel, which I never, it's never going to respond because there's no value on it, or the timeout channel. And what you do is it'll pat, like, I'm matching on this channel, or I'm matching on that channel, and then I get the value here as a parameter to the, the body. This is like basically an implicit body of a lambda. Uh, if you run this guy, same thing. It's no different. Just, just, it's just sugar. It's just like sugar for matching on a particular channel. So I could have written this like this, right? I'm going to do a little bit of live coding. Con p equal, um, something like that. I can go if it equaled c log js console um, the channel at a value or closed and hopefully I didn't, oops hopefully I didn't make any mistakes um, oh I love I love closure script it gives me errors all right so we should see the same thing happen yes so it's just sugar for doing that, right? It's just sugar for conditionally matching on which channel responded. Make sense? OK. Um, so here's, here's where it gets really fun. So we can hold, we can hold when we do the recursion, uh, we can use, I've been using while, while true, just to represent sort of an infinite recursion. But here we can, we can, we can make a loop, and we can store state in the loop. So this is a, this is a channel which in which enforces that we only get distinct values out of it. We're only going to get distinct value out of this channel. So if somebody puts in the same value more than once, we're, we're only going to see the first time that it appeared, which is very useful in user interfaces. So here's distinct. It takes a channel. And here's the out channel. We're going to loop. The last value that we saw, of course, initializes to nil. We're going to read it in. As long as what we read in is not equal to last, then we can write it to the out. And then we recur, right? So this, this, this will only write to out when we get a unique value. So here, once, it, once again, it's like all this stuff composes in like a functional way, except it's asynchronous programming. So I've got key presses. I'm going to convert them into their key codes. I only care about the key codes. I only want the distinct key codes. I'm going to print them out. So if I'm up here and I'm pressing D, it only worked once. I'm pressing A, F. If I start typing lots of different keys, OK. But right, I can't repeat a key. Ever or just in I'm sorry? Because I was just typing really fast. Like, I don't know what, what keys. Yes, oh, yes, it's, it's only. Yeah, right. It's, it's got to be in a sequence. But of course, you could, I, could, I could keep memory. Like, I could. So let's do that. That's is actually fun. <laughs> OK, so here we're going well, to create a set out of it. We're gonna, yeah, exactly. Never again. <laughs> Oops. We're going to call this scene when not contains scene. And what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to um, conj scene x. Live coding, code review. Does it look right? <laughs> so I, I have a starting set. If I've seen it, if I haven't seen it before, we write it out. I add it to the scene set, and hopefully this is going to work. And then I got it. Never again. Uh, let me. Why is this? I don't know why that happened. Whatever. Okay. Here we go. Oh, I'm running out of keys. <laughs> All right. That's pretty cool. So we can hold state in the loop. OK. So here is a, a possible implementation for something called fan in, which some, might, some people might call merge. 
So fan n can take a vector of channels, as many as you want. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to merge them into a single channel. Right? So this is really useful. You have tons of inputs coming in, and you want to be able to read from one thing. You don't want to have to manage all these different sources. You can merge them into a single source. Um, so how does this work? Uh, we have a vector of ins. But this, what, what's really cool about this is alt takes a vector. So this is trivial to write. Right? Alt already takes a vector of channels. So whenever I get some, I and I only care about the value, I don't care about which one responded, and I can just write, at, write, that, out, um, uh, write that value out. So this will take a bunch of different things and write it out. Um, so I'm going to move a bit more quickly because I don't want to talk forever. Um, so I want to demonstrate here that one thing that's really cool about CSP is CSP works as both a push and pull system. Right? So this is really important. I can make generators. Right? Remember I said, if, if I write and nobody reads, right, then I have a process that's stuck. But I can, make something, I can make a process that simply is a generator so that I can source values out of it. Right? It's not actually generating its values asynchronously. It's just, it's just something I want to be able to stream things out of. So this is what this is. This is, a int, this is a channel that just simply produces ints. And we can do this because we can hold the current integer inside the loop. Right? So if somebody starts reading off of this, they're going to start getting integers starting at uh, 1. Here's a different channel, which is also pretty useful. It's a channel where you've given a millisecond delay. It will simply bang a value onto the channel. It's just going to put the current date at different intervals. So you could use this to throttle something. right? You can, you can think about it. You can start using these different channels and compose them. So you could use this to throttle another channel. right? Uh, so here, this one's kind of big, and I kind of don't. Uh, do I? OK, I'll, I'll explain this as quickly as I possibly can. So what I want to show here is that we can sort of do cooperative multi, sort of, sort of multi-threading, even though that JavaScript doesn't have native threads. So I can construct a process and give it a name. And then I can give it a control channel. And this is actually a very common pattern. So the control channel, if I ever write to it, it's going to turn that process on or off. So think about this. I can construct n channels, and I can use their controls to say, it's your turn to start computing. Stop. It's your turn to start computing. Stop. And so on. And this is, this is quite cool. Um, I want to show other things, so I'm not going to dive into how, exactly how this works. But let's just see that it does, in fact, do what I say that it does. Um, so you're going to see what's going to happen is every time I press space bar, so the process, I'm using the interval, and I'm using ints. So ints is a generator, and, and I'm using the bang from the interval channel to generate the integers. If I press space bar, it's going to switch. And I, I have multiple loops going on here. So I'm not just using the integers channel. I'm actually using it as an accumulator. So I have an inner loop, which is actually reading off of each process and then adding you know, the, the, the next set of integers. If I press space bar again, I go back precisely to where I was in the other process. Right? So this is pretty complicated. right? I've, I've composed a bunch of channels, and I basically can do sort of like cooperative multitasking. Um, so you, you have to handle that case. Because if you, cause what'll happen if you don't handle it, you'll probably accidentally write a, try, write a nil onto another channel, and that'll blow up. You'll get an error. You know, it'll tell you what you tried to do. You'll only get it at runtime. So you you if you know so when you design your system yeah you just have to handle you just have to handle closing. So things like the panic, how would that work? So I, I I kept my case simple because you you want to be more robust but um, uh, there were there was no such thing as fan in so I wrote it there is now something called merge which handles closing so I would just use the provided merge so a lot of the stuff that I'm showing you don't use my versions they are now official versions of these operators. That, that are robust uh, um, enough for that. So, so a lot of those libraries just they they, they require to you use functional composition, and so a lot of what I'm showing you is I get I get I get to write regular closure code, like right? I don't have to write everything in terms of combinators. If you're going to do async.js, 
you're sort of limited to everything has to be combined via functions, which may or may not be nice depending on what you're doing. Um, I won't. Gonna, there's there's a, bit, a much bigger example that I'll show you that I would hate to write in that style. I've seen people do it in that style, and it's horrible. Um, but that's the main difference: is that a lot this this go inside of a go block because it transforms your code for you into a state machine. You get to write your code in a natural style. You don't have to do everything through functional composition. Um, so here's a, here's, here's a pretty cool non-trivial thing. This is actually a port of some Go code. So this is something that I know people write in Java, or have had to write in JavaScript if you do JavaScript. So this, I'm going to run, uh, what I want to do, I'm going to show this code. So what I want to do here is I want to run three queries at the same time. Each query runs two possible um, queries that might return, right? I want to run a web one query, web two query, where, uh, image one, image two, video one, video two. I want to print out three results, right? So whoever, which, whether web one returns first or web two returns first, I want the fastest one of those two. And I want the entire thing to have an 80 millisecond timeout, right? Imagine writing that in JavaScript. That's not going to be fun. Um, but this, this is basically, we get to write the code pretty much how we would describe it. I write the fastest queries. I write them into the channel. I have a timeout of 80 milliseconds on the whole thing. Um, and that's it. So if I run this, right, so web one, image one, video one. Image two, web one, video one. No, 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 nobody returned a result within 80 milliseconds. And this is the type of thing that, that, that you often want to be able to write very succinctly, but you often write in kind of a big mess. And so core async really lets us sort of avoid those messes when we're doing a lot of asynchronous uh, code. Does that make sense? OK. So we're going to get quite a bit fancier. So here's just a bunch of boilerplate around um, uh, the, no, uh, the DOM. David. Yes. So no, they keep going. So again, if you want to make it more robust, you'll have to, each one of those processes should take a, a cancel. Right? So that's something, I, again, I, I'm trying to keep my example simple so that you, just get, you can mostly get it. This entire repo is on GitHub, so you can, you can run these examples yourself. Um, what, what? Yeah, yeah, the address, yes. Um, OK, so. They, I mean, they are. They are queues. The channels are queues, fundamentally. But we get a nicer interface towards them than we, than we normally have. Um, OK, so I want to sort of talk a bit about what I actually described in, my, um, in the description of this talk, which is how we can sort of take these primitives and build um, extremely responsive interfaces. So I'm going to show you that I can use the exact same code uh, for doing um, list item selection, like, like highlighting. I can use the same code whether I'm targeting the DOM or whether I'm like making a text adventure game. I can actually use the exact same async handling code for both interfaces. It just doesn't matter. So what does it look like? <clears throat> Here is the selection, the selector, the selection process. So what it does is it takes a, an in channel, and the in channel is basically has a bunch of events. And I've decided we're going to see what these events are. And then we take something that represents the list. This could be something in the DOM, or it could be a JavaScript array, which we're going to use to render to like some text adventure game. And then the list of things that are to be selected. Um, we're going to produce an out channel. So when we start, when we enter, the, when we construct the selector, obviously nothing is selected. If we get an event on in, right, um, then we need to handle it. So if the channel closed, we say, boom, selection process is done. Uh, if we got a select event, then what do we do? We write out the selected piece of data to out, and then we recur, setting the loop, the state in the loop to be whatever was currently selected. Otherwise, we receive the number, which is telling us you know, which thing um, um, should, be, should be selected. What I mean, actually, and I'm, I'm confusing this, highlight it. Which thing to highlight, basically? Um, and if we get a number, we unselect the previous selected thing. Um, if, uh, if we get out, oh, sorry, if we get out, so if you mouse out, like this, uh, so if I mouse out and re there's nothing should be selected, we clear the selection, 
um, if I get a number, um, then we want to select that thing, and we select it, and we recur. So again, I wish I had more time, but you can look at this code later. But the idea is I have a, a channel which has either select something or a number to highlight something. So let's demo this. So what we're going to do is we have a we're going to we're going to grab the DOM element, we're going to allow hovering over the uh, uh, and that is a list element a UL and we're going to allow hovering we're going to have a hover channel over the UL for each of the LI elements. Um, we're going to allow key we're going to allow movement by key if I press up or down. So this is this is going to we're going to fan in right. We're going to allow um, hovering over select highlighting something in the list whether it's a mouse or whether it's keys. Um, we're going to support selecting if we click. Right? And then um, we're going to make a selector and see we can fan in. We can fan in three independent streams of events. Hover events, click events, and clicks. This is why fan, like merging streams is, is really nice. The other thing is that like, if you've done a lot of JavaScript, you often like, spread your event handling code all over the place. And this is like, you, you can actually collect uh, all your event handling into one logical location. Um, so let's run this guy. Whoops, what did I do wrong? Huh. Thanks, Git. Uh. Sorry. OK. So there we have um, our hover. I can use my, I can use the arrows. I can, I can click, and you see it prints out the result down there. Um, and what I want to show is that we can apply the exact same thing to um, a text adventure representation. So here, you're going to note like this is literally almost identical, right? So I, I just want to, I just want to use the the window as the source of the key events. And there's just a bunch of details around that. But you notice the selector. This, the, the critical function is unchanged. It's gonna be, there's not going to be any difference for, for, for doing this different uh, visual representation. So there it is down there at the bottom. Right? So this is pretty, this is, this is, this is uh, to me, like one of the biggest ideas and something that I've been looking for for a very long time when it comes to UI programming, which is that. We design um, our UIs around, a, at, about, around events, but at a really abstract level. A way, you know, separated from, am I going to build something in the DOM? Am I going to build something on the iPhone? And is it going to use touches? Or is it going to use mouse clicks? Or I'm going to have to do a text UI? Or I'm going to have to do an audio-based UI? Or Braille, right? What people actually end up rewriting these components over and over and over again for every possible target. But with, with this model, where we actually really abstract out away from the concrete event sources, then we can have really truly reusable components. Um, we don't have to rewrite that logic. Uh, so I have, um, what's the Wi-Fi here? A password? Uh oh, there's no public one? That's okay. <laughs> oh, it worked. Yeah. Oh. Oh, Docker? David's iPhone. No. Oh, yeah, I see it. There we go. Sweet. Okay. Let's try again. 
No, no, it's going to work. All right. So if you want to know more about this, I've written like tons of blog posts. Um, so starting with like this one, um, there's a lot of fun stuff. Um, a lot of the examples I showed are available here. And then I spent some time um, doing a very extensive blog post because I was, you know, it was like, does this actually scale for like something non-trivial, something that I would actually write for work? Uh, so I, I took um, an autocompleter, like basically autocompleters, like combo box autocompleters are actually a massive pain in the ass to, to, to write code for because it's really complicated. You have to handle tab, you have to handle uh, input blur, input focus. I mean, it's, it's really crazy. The amount of events you have to handle, you have to asynchronously fetch from some server. Anyways, it's a good non-trivial thing. Uh, the autocompleter in jQuery is like 500 lines of code and it's completely unreadable. Uh, the Twitter autocompleter is like thousands of lines of code, completely unreadable. Nobody can understand this. Uh, so I've, I, I was like, it's a good, it's a good uh, uh, example to try. Can we build a more sensible system um, that's constructive out of reusable components? So here is the autocompleter that I built with Core Async. So I can go. Uh, so a lot of things, a lot of subtle things work. When I press delete, it disappeared. Right. Oh. If I press tab. Um, Right, mouse, mouse out. Lots of subtle things like if you use Google, they, they do lots of clever things. Like what happens if I click, drag, come back on an element and it's not the same one? If I click, drag, and come back on the same one. So this is, this is all stuff that very serious autocompleters have to do in order for users to not be completely pissed off. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, was, this, was, this was fun. So this is actually literate. So I, I have all the code for the whole thing. Um, and you can read it, and you can sort of see how it works. This actually also works in IE8. So that's the other really cool thing is that I didn't want to. I didn't want to do. I actually didn't want to fix it for like. There's actually no problems with the JavaScript. There are problems with the CSS. IE8 was as much patience as I had. But um, my first blog post on on Core Async. Uh, every example on this one works in IE6. So that's that's the other thing that's pretty cool is that Core Async. I mean, we generate um, very much common denominator JavaScript. We don't do anything fancy. And that, I think, is pretty cool. So you can target other browsers, old browsers and, and write very nice asynchronous code. Yeah, so that, that's. Yeah, Firefox is slow. I, I mean, there's nothing we can do about that. I mean, I complain. I, you know, I like, Firefox is slow. Come on. <laughs> um, but they're working on it. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the problems with Firefox are mostly, from what I can tell, due to garbage collection. And they're working on a generational garbage collector, so hopefully that will fix um, ClojureScript um, on uh, Firefox. Uh, but, but, but if you, if you write like a, you know, targeting Well, I mean, part of the thing that when I demoed this was that, like, um, uh, it's, it, the idea is more like that, number one, if you're doing that many number of updates, like that's pretty extreme. And it, and it, 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 I mean, people have already started building stuff with, with Core Async. And we've done a lot. Like uh, This blog post was written before we did a bunch of optimization. We've done a ton of optimization. I, I actually don't know how we can make it any faster. It's pretty fast. Um, but like, for example, here's 100,000 100, 100, updates on the DOM. And so Core Async, because we, can, because we can, basically, I didn't talk about this at all. But you can have buffered channels, and buffered channels allow you to basically split up the work. So this is a buffered channel, and you notice the UI is not locked up. It's 100,000 DOM updates. So that's pretty cool. So there's a lot of flexibility for, for doing interactive stuff. Other questions? So you about that here, and then you can oh, that's a, so this is what's really awesome. So if you're used to promises or futures, which have a horrible error handling story, in my opinion. Um, so I have a whole blog post on asynchronous error handling. So the Go blocks support try catch. So this is amazing. So that means I can have three independent asynchronous operations. I've written a little macro. And all it does is if anybody writes an error value onto a channel, when we read it, we throw. And this is amazing because you're going to get an accurate stack trace, right? You're going to have the original error, which has its stack trace. Then you're going to also have where inside your Go block it failed, right? 
So it's, it's a much nicer. So all promise implementations, if you use promises in JavaScript, because promises are monadic, they end up wrapping, and the stack trace gets obliterated. So you know, you know, you have to explicitly handle errors. You have to, you have to th think, oh, this might fail, so I'm going to write an error. I'm going to handle. I'm going to catch the error, write it into the channel, so that somebody down upstream can like catch it, and decide what to do with it. Which maybe, you know, wrap it again. But but the thing that's still cool about this is that so normally, normally when you have an error, right? If you use like a promises model, it's just you're just you're just going to get a mangled stack. So this actually allows us to uh, handle errors across async boundaries of the event loop, right? Normally the stack is gone, right? There's no stack because you, it was an asynchronous op, right? And you, somebody else was expecting an asynchronous op. So I can throw an error, catch it, wrap it in another error, throw an error, catch it, wrap it, and then, I can, then when, I, when I have it, I can actually un, open up that error and say, OK, this is the stack trace at this point in the event loop. This is the stack trace at this point in the event loop. This is the stack trace, which is pretty cool. So so there's so so a good so a good so I, I mean I was sort of alluding to that with control channels. So so you often like I want to make a channel, but I also want if I get back the channel, I want to give it a control. Like when I construct it, so if I put anything in the control, the other channel closes. It's a common pattern. I, I'll, actually, a lot of the tricks that I recommend, it's like the Go people. They have a lot of tricks, and honestly, we mostly just copy the tricks that we've seen because they've been doing this for a couple years now. Other. Questions? If uh, if your positive blocks the two in the system, then it debugs it all in the code inspector. Like, do you sort of write program and you're not sure why the particular thing is returning the answer to the program and it seems really hung up or so so so. So I mean, it, like it is sometimes tricky. Don't, don't get me wrong. Like core, like the, the the main source of bugs in core async. It's not like everything I've shown you is like awesome because I've worked on it and like spent some time <laughs> putting it together. But so in CSP, you have this problem of deadlock, right? And that's the problem where you inadvertently read and then nobody will ever write, or you read and nobody ever puts, right? This. So. No, I mean, you, you can't really do this. But something that we've been working on that we just landed a couple weeks ago that needs more work, but it does pretty much work, which is source maps. Yeah. So ideally, source maps would allow you to um, set a breakpoint on the thing. And then when you, when you get that spot, you'll be able to at least say, what, what's, what, are my, what do my locals look like? So honestly, what I've been doing uh, up until that point was using just print debugging and printing out what, what's going on. So ideally, and again, I haven't had time to test this, when you set the breakpoint, you, you get there and you can look at the stack and like, where am I? What's got passed in? Yeah. Other questions? Nope. Cool? Oh. Um, so we're just so Rich Hickey wrote, wrote a bunch of like a lot of the things I've shown I hand rolled and so Rich recently landed um, uh, official versions of all the stuff that handles closing and all this stuff uh, publish subscribe like I didn't really talk about PubSub at all and so he has a lot of stuff around PubSub um, a lot of stuff around pausing resuming like all these things that are really nice when you want to build a system that you honestly don't want to have to write yourself. Um, they'll be a part of the standard library, so you don't you don't have to do that. So that's that's really the big thing. And then a lot of that stuff I haven't even had a chance to play around with, um, but I'm really excited about that because that's you know stuff that people don't have to write. Is it still an alpha? Yeah, definitely still alpha. I mean, and it's probably going to be alpha you know for a little while as people you know try out the standard library functions. I mean, a lot of what I've shown you is just real primitive, right? And a lot of my examples I had to build stuff from scratch. So. You know, in the next few months, people are going to stop doing that and use the standard stuff. 
But people are already deploying it. I, I mean, people are already writing production code. It's, it's pretty, I mean, the, especially on the Clojure side, it's very solid. And there's been a lot of, it's been, I've seen a lot of excitement about Clojure Script because of Core Async. You know, front end devs are like, whoa, this is pretty cool. I think that's good. Yeah.